Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the ornate iron gantry jutting out over the pit of your despair. And uh, it's time for more Transistor. This is probably episode 10. I still do not keep track, but I think that's where we are at. And before we play today, I just want to mention that my neighbours are indulging in their favourite hobby of stomping up and down the stairs extremely loudly, very unpredictably, and for reasons that I do not understand. So if there's any clumping in the background of this video, that's what that is. Uh, sorry if that's frustrating on the audio quality. I do not know what is wrong with these people. Anyway, that's besides the point. Let's get into it. First thing I want to mention is something that I haven't mentioned in this area, but that I've gestured at previously. We are on a rooftop, you know, dipping in and out of industrial areas and industrial part of the city. And yeah, here we see these delightful enga engravings of what I think are uh, lotus leaves or possibly ginkgo leaves. I can't remember. But um, this kind of heavily echoes the styling you would see in the 20s and the 30s, and even a little bit earlier, as sort of industrialised um, decoration was finally available, like, more commonly and more widely and more cheaply. Um, which meant that ordinary people started getting ornate things, or, you know, the wealthy had a lot more ornate things a lot more easily. And it kind of just reinforces the sort of early 1900s Art Nouveau, Art Deco feel, you know? Like, I have seen engraved uh, engraved brass plates that look exactly like that. Anyway, let's go. Don't know if I can handle more jumping around. Yeah, me neither. We'll just take a peek. Somewhere in here, there's a file on everyone in town. Safe and secure. So, one of the things that interests me here, as this song, which is one of the best songs on the soundtrack, and it's a very good soundtrack, kicks in, um... Well, I ruined that moment, huh? Um, is that um, that same styling comes through here. These grates are quite obviously modeled on the kind of grates you would see uh, Boys. Been a while. very consistently in, you know, in the parts of skyscrapers in New York that still exist that were made in the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s. But this brings us to a slightly more interesting, this brings us to a slightly more sinister aspect. <laughs> Namely that, um, here we see a little bit more clearly the sort of sinister aspect of Cloud Bank, which is that it is a total constant surveillance dystopia. To think that this city is kind of presented as being a good thing, it's pretty heavily implied that most of the people who live here like it here and admire it and are dedicated to their extremely idealized um digital democracy but for all that it has that digital democracy it's a complete surveillance state there is no privacy you exist within the context of this um all-seeing digital eye that is recording everything you're doing all of the time so that it can integrate you with its society and that's actually presented as kind of a good thing. Until next time. Which I'm thinking will be pretty soon. Because that is the society that the Camerata are trying to change. The Camerata are the villains. Generally speaking, the villains don't have a good thing. Curves around toward the back. Don't have good ideals at heart. Or if they do have good ideals, they are implementing There's them wrongly. So I think it's interesting that there's this sort of completely unexamined tension where it's like, what if there was a society like that, but it worked good and the people in it accepted it completely? Probably all sorts of dirt on the Camerata tucked away around here. But also, that's not an aspect the Camerata are trying, trying to change. They want a just as plugged in society. However, what they do not want is such a kind of flowing, changing society. And of course, in the real world, the idea that you could have a flowing, changing society that is always pushing forwards and always progressive, that all is also such a constant, uh, like, surveillance state with such constant monitoring and observation is, is kind of impossible, actually. So let's see what this says. Designation jerk. I would not want to agitate this particular specimen. I would strongly advise against any such thing. Do not disturb, although it is quite docile, really. Not easily disturbed, but not to be disturbed. Its large frame suggests to me that it is an older form, less efficient, less capable in some ways, though specialised, specialised like all the rest. It wouldn't still be around if it didn't have its uses, and if you look at it, you can guess what it's for, I'm sure. 
You need a good plot of land to build on. Why? Here's the process you ought to call. Royce is probably the character we get by far the most dialogue out of, short of um, Boxer in the Transistor himself. Um, and I do enjoy that his notes are very clearly written in. In fact, I think I mentioned this before, but clearly written in that kind of um, post-turn-of-the-century authorial voice. Roll, paver, features, piston flatteners, overdrive system and grapple shot. Vulnerabilities, none. Preferences, pulverizing and absorption. So, um, a simple man with simple tastes, I guess. So yeah, the Camerata's desires to change the society don't actually interact particularly with those aspects of that society. That's just how this world is run, that's just how it functions, that's just how it is. Uh, hmm, okay, these things are protecting themselves. I guess I have to actually wait for the protection to run out before I get the chance to smash them. When you have, um, the, uh, friend-making power equipped, it makes it a lot easier to deal with these, uh, 3.0 cheerleaders because, um, they stop shielding themselves pretty much instantaneously when you, uh, flip them to your side, which is just convenient. I mean, you can't attack them until the, uh, until that wears off anyway. How can I see whether it's protected or not? Uh, I guess it's not. Yeah, okay. I fought tougher fights, but now that the creeps are starting to get those suction beams, they're actually a lot more dangerous than they look. Is that the last one? Yep. Who else? I feel like I'm a bit short on XP and I'm not really sure why. Got another message waiting. There's always more messages. Grant sounds swell for a murderer. Grant can't talk right now because he isn't well. Listen, I'm doing everything I can. For him. I know there's still time. But the truth is, ever since you took the transistor from him, he just hasn't been the same. When you see him, I think you'll understand. When I get up there, you're going to tell me everything so if you want my help. Fix their mistake. Yeah, they do need us to fix their mistake. It's like you never met well intentioned villains whose uh, methods escaped from them and got out of hand before. There's something interesting about Grant that I want to talk about. Um, actually, more broadly, one thing that I love about this game is that the paintings used for its cutscenes are gorgeous, but also extremely well composed. I think that Gen Z, as I've mentioned before, is a brilliant artist. And um, very simply... Um, Some kind of break room up there. Oh, I'll use that in a second. There is a... <laughs> A consistent trend of um, just using really simple but really effective methods. Grant is always pictured as larger and looming and aloof in his body language. Each of the four Camerata members has very distinct and clear designs and body languages that tell us about who they are as a person. Grant is always powerful and always above the others. Um, this makes sense since he's being set up as the main villain of the game. However, as we will find out later, it's actually doing that to lay the groundwork for subverting that uh, concept. Guess if you're gonna spend hours poring over files or running half across town, eventually you're gonna need a break. Go ahead, it's open. Pretend I'm not here. Just hurry back. Good. Good. So, one thing I've noticed is that much like all of the cutscenes, I have things to say about that cutscene. I have things to say about all these cutscenes. And I've wanted to do that the whole way through. However, what I've noticed is that because I don't We're want to. Top level. Oldest archives. Always imagine there'd be more. Because I don't want to talk over the uh, cutscene itself. This means that I end up not saying it, and then I forget to say it later. So one of the things I think I'm going to do is that the bonus episode at the end of this series is actually going to be a compilation of cutscenes from the game, and I will talk about why these paintings are very skillfully made and very effective 
or what they want to be. So, you know, look forward to that, look out for that, I guess, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Other than that, I'm mostly wondering why I have less XP on here than I do in my uh, <laughs> practice mode. Because I should have fought all of the same fights. One of the things I've wondered is if, the, is if you maybe get more XP if you let the cells spawn into some bad cells, but I've never seen bad cells listed on the end of fight um, tally board. Anyway, I'm going to have to be careful not to take another hit because I don't want to lose any functions. Much like in real life, getting hit makes you less functional. Is that, is that actually enough to finish that one? Oh, fantastic. Is there another guy? Yeah, there he is. It's very amusing to me when you've accidentally left a cheerleader for the end because they have no attack. So they kind of just sprint around panicking almost. The fact that these are fairly simply coded, you know, AI bots that behave in such a way in real life, as in these are little, what do they do with those snapshots? you know, fictional code machines running around doing their well, let's own. See what we can find up here. Running around and doing their own things, um, according to their own simple set of algorithmic rules. It's quite amusing to me that that is also literally what these are in that world. It's a way to get. Uh, oddly realistic behavior out of, um, you know, very definitely unrealistic enemies, you know? If an enemy is depicted as, as being a human being and you are supposed to believe it is a human being in the game you are playing, um, you need to be very careful to actually make it behave intelligently, otherwise people will possibly be frustrated even um, by its lack of human behavior. This is why, for example, Valve's um, Half-Life games have always been praised as having really good AI. The AI isn't actually that good in most Half-Life games. The trick they pull is that they... Um, well, first off, the original Half-Life was uh, coming into a scene where um, AI was generally just very bad overall. So they didn't have to do much. But the other thing is that they fake it. The AI will randomly decide to throw a grenade. And then it will send a message to a different AI unit. Or, well, they're all the same thing. They're all controlled by the same intelligence, really. Um, and have that unit say, hey, throw a grenade. Then the other one that was originally planning to throw its grenade throws its grenade. This looks to the player as if these are um, coherent, sensible entities cooperating. Um, so I think it's a clever trick to completely avoid that issue. Just obviate it totally by quite simply having your having your enemies behave like confusable foolable robots so we're gonna grab this one which is gonna raise some questions in a minute um i'm gonna take this because uh, more memory is more useful than more slots at the moment we don't really have more um functions than we can use currently fundamental irony here is that the Camerata's desire was to prevent the loss of the history of this city. They became frustrated with the way that the city is constantly changing um, in accordance with its baked-in democratic values. Kind of right. Yeah, yeah. As it switches up constantly. Um, and that they wanted to preserve that city and have some greater sense of stability, despite the fact it's clearly a very stable society. Um, so the real irony of the fact that the, the process they have unleashed is... Uh, destroying everything they worked to achieve. Bracket. I know the name, but not the man. Heard he got out of town a while back. So, spoilers, but this, the fourth member of the Camerata, is going to turn out to be the true villain of the game, and the villain for the pretty much the entire second half of the game. Um, this is... or well, the final third? I'm not sure how far we are through the game. It's either half or two-thirds of the way through. But, the fact that you can get this trace now uh, raises some questions, in all honesty. Because my working assumption has always been that the traces are the remnants of people, essentially, uh, that the sword has eaten or absorbed in whatever way it does. Uh, hmm. 
Hmm, actually being able to deal damage while off turn is actually really useful. Huh. Good to go. Yeah, I'm good now. So if that's the case, how can Royce be have how can he have his function integrated into the sword already? That's two. Big door downstairs ought to be open now. Perhaps it's possible to integrate Take someone into the sword. Perhaps their trace is more like their societal impression. In this digital society, every part of them is recorded, therefore you could probably simulate them pretty well. Based on those recordings. So because of that, maybe that's what the trace is, and perhaps the Camerata, due to their uh, familiarity and usage of the transistor over the past like ambiguous period of time, would mean that they can already integrate their traces into it, simply by virtue of that uh, closeness, that access, or even do so on purpose for, the, for, for fairly obvious reasons, you know, in case of disastrous eventuality, as they say. Smashy smashy. Robot go bang. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but being able to do damage at all while off turn is useful. In fact, there are particular um, functions dedicated to that. One of the things I do want to mention is that I don't think we will unlock all of the functions on this run. Um, to unlock and fully upgrade all of the functions, you kind of have to uh, be doing New Game Plus and playing through again, because there's simply not enough fights to get enough experience to get everything as you go through the game. Getting kind of up to the wire here. Oh, disrupted? What was that? I guess bad cells can do some kind of disruption effect now. I need to be careful of that. I think that was the bad cell anyway. Which looks like it knocks me out of turn if I go into it. Do I have enough range? Just about. I still think cluckers are extremely dumb and weird. It's considering how elegant and um, careful and sort of serious in its uh, aesthetics the rest of the game is. It's so strange to me that they decided to just have giant. Oh, it's the ch it's the cluckers that do the disruption. Okay. I mean, I talked about this before. It's a very super giant thing to have these kind of like blends of the primarily serious. Um, but include the kind of frivolous or silly as a as an additional component. So let's see about Royce. Yes, okay. So um, I'll read him through once we've finished completely unlocking him, but that is going to be all from me for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you stick around, and I especially hope that you show up for the uh, bonus episode at the end of this series. Anyway, that's all. Goodbye. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.